Hello and welcome to CIO Leadership Live in ASEAN. My name is James Henderson, Editorial Director of CIO based in Singapore, and I'll be your host today as we welcome Benjamin Mann, CTO of Food Panda and our CIO 75 honoree in 2021. Ben, how are you? I am excellent. Thank you for having me, James. Good stuff. Thank you for taking the time. Now, we obviously know Food Panda as the brand, as a consumer in terms of using the products and the services, but maybe talk us through the tech journey and, and everything behind the scenes that maybe we're not privy to as a consumer. Hmm. Yeah, so if you remember back 10, 12, 15 years ago, if it's 9 p.m. and you want a pizza or some food late at night, right? Uh, uh, the only option that you had is like you find a phone number, you dial and you get it delivered, right? Um, and we came onto the scene 10 years ago and we were the first to offer this experience online, first via the web and then very soon releasing the app now, right? And if you now flash forward 10 years later, I think it's become a a fantastic journey in, in, in a very complex business that as a consumer, even when I joined this industry as a consumer, I was not aware of the complexity that, that happens behind it in order to get you food delivered in 30, 25 minutes or less. All the things that you need to sync together to make that work. Um, it's been a fascinating journey. Yeah, because I suppose as the consumer, you don't care, right? You just want the pizza. So yeah. <laughs> I, as a consumer, even I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very heavy user, clearly, of our product. Like I, I just want my food. I'm hungry and I'm impatient usually at this point in time. So I want food. But the technology that makes this happen is staggeringly complex in the background. And just on that, because you're right, I mean, obviously, we're I'm trivializing it a little bit there in terms of, you know, the, the user, the wants, but it's it's a key part of the value prop, right? The, that convenience and speed. Yeah. So how, how are you creating and building the infrastructure at the back end to allow you to innovate at scale and, and, and meet those demands that the users have? So first and foremost, I mean, the infrastructure and the technology is one part, but it's really about the people that built the product and that built the product for our users, right? Uh, and we have created a culture where we've built teams that can own parts of the user journey and parts of the product or entire products by themselves and drive them autonomously forward, right? Um, with that, it allows us to iterate very fast, to run dozens, hundreds of experiments at, at any given point in time. So um, across all of our markets, so we operate in 11 markets, more than 400 cities. And if you're a user somewhere at a point, there's a high chance that you're part of some of the experiments that we're running. Um, and these experiments range from very small, where we want to optimize a user experience, where we say, okay, mm -hmm. Does this button work better for a user if we move it a bit more up? Does this item work better if we make it animated or so? Um, to fundamentally different things where we say, hmm, how would a user react if we change the entire user journey for a small segment and experiment around this, right? Um, and that allows us to generate petabytes of data that we then can use to improve our user experience. And I'll, I'll get into the, the data side because obviously that's key on the user experience. But you made a good point there, Ben, around that experimentation. I mean, how do you do it? Is it small little slices and, and you kind of see what the user reacts to or is it wholesale changes? I mean, I'm trying to think back as a user how, how, uh, how those changes have gone out, but how would you approach it? Uh, we try to approach it uh, in both ways, to be honest, um, depending a little bit on what we're trying to achieve with this experiment or, or which hypothesis we want to validate. So we do a lot of experiments that are given the entire customer journey very narrow, um, where we focus on one particular touch point. So for example, how do we make it more convenient for the user to edit his order in case he made a mistake or he forgot something, right? Um, which are small slices of the, of the customer journey to very large experiments where we say, what would happen if we radically redesign the home screen experience for, for an entire segment of our users? Um, where we really take a significant part of the journey and we run four or five experiments in parallel and see what happens. Um, we use this extensively, like, as I said, at any given point in time, there is easily somewhere between 30 and 100 experiments running across all markets, all customer segments, all, all, all platforms. 
Well, and obviously some some land and, and some down, but it's that trial and error approach, I think. Yeah, and, and I think what makes us really successful, and, and it's, it's a culture that I'm very proud of, is we kind of celebrate failure around this. We take every experiment where we encounter really unexpected results, and that these do happen, um, especially for things that internally we are very much in love with, where we think, ah, oh, this is the greatest thing in sliced bread that we're inventing here. And then we run an experiment and it's just completely tanks, right? So the numbers tell us our users really don't respond well to this behavior in, in, in the app, right? We, we take this as a celebration, right? Where we say, okay, hmm, unexpected, but fascinating because we just learned something about our users and, and, and our product that we didn't know before. And that's the entire, the entire reason why we do experiments, right? So we don't want to, we try to avoid running experiments to validate our theories. We try, we try to frame our experiments in a way, in a very scientific approach. Here's an experiment. The outcome can be inconclusive. Sometimes that does happen, right? The outcome can be positive or the outcome can be negative. But no matter what the result is, we take all of it as a, as a good result for us. And I suppose you've got, and you've got that perfect blend of the data, but then the humility and the, the market awareness to, to be, you know, be flexible on that depending on what the response is. And talk to me about the, the data a little bit more there, Ben, because you obviously you're creating huge volumes of data how is that plugged into the user experience, customer experience, however we want to phrase it? How are you connecting those dots? So what we do with all the data that we are collecting is we run them through several data pipelines and, and we run them through, through several analyst, analytic systems. And all of it then goes back to the individual product teams um, for their slices of data. And they use this data in near real time to design their experiments, to design also product enhancements to, these, to drive roadmaps or change roadmaps also, because that happens quite a bit where we start seeing signals in this data that tell us, hmm, maybe we should pivot this product a little bit to the left or to the right. We use it every day in, in nearly all the decisions that we make. And you'll need that at a real time basis, right? Because of the how close you are to the user. So for for certain segments of our data, um, especially if it's related to the performance and the quality of the app and the user experience, we strive to be as real time as possible, right? Um, for other parts where we need to run more complex analytics, we do this in time frames that can range from hours to days, depending on the scope of the setup that we have. So thank you for taking us under the hood of, uh, of Food Panda there in terms of the app and what actually makes it all work underneath. Now, obviously beyond tech, there's, there's a lot more in terms of purpose and how you're actually, you know, in, in, aside from the product enhancements, which are obviously key, but very much that day-to-day -day responsibility. How are you tapping in to grow, you know, using technology to grow communities and what's the, your role within that context? So it's a very critical part of our entire mission. The reason why we are here, right, is... And there's different aspects of it, and all of them are equally important for me, right? So one is enabling our local communities. Like, how do we get small and micro uh, SMEs, right? How do we get them onto our platform and expose them to our user base, which are very often partners that are not very technology savvy, right? So, and, and especially given the last two years, many of them had their first touch point with technology and, and, and our industry as a whole. And that was a big struggle for them. So we built products and we built systems and processes that allows them to onboard into this as fluid as, as, fluid as possible, like a digital native, right? Um, where we spent a lot of time on, on educating, simplifying also our product features on the back end to make it easier for partners to come onto our platform investing heavily in, into things where we can give guidance to our, our partners. How should they structure a menu? Because a menu that is appealing for online ordering is very often different or looks different than a menu that is appealing for an in-dining customer, right? Um, it's building things like our new in-dining product where we consciously drive footfall back into restaurants and, and, and partners after the pandemic, which is like a super crucial thing for our communities, right? Um, 
Then there is, of course, things that we do for our riders. How do we uh, make their journeys easier, safer? How do we enable contactless delivery to protect them also in times of, of, of pandemics? Um, how do we make them have a better journey through throughout their entire their entire time with Food Panda? And the third part is what do we do in, in terms of donations? So we have this feature, for example, in, in the app where you can donate meals, where we across the entire platform donated millions of meals so far, right? And also together with Delivery Euro to people in need, to people in terms of the experiencing a crisis. Um, and the fourth part, which I think is often forgotten, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we're very heavily involved in this also is, how do we give back as technology company to the local technology, to growing a local technology group, right? And, and to giving young people at the beginning of their career the necessary guidance and mentorship and enabling them to have a good start in, into their career, right? So I'm an, to give you an example, I'm an engineer by design. I've, I've, I've always built software and I've always built things. And... I find it much harder to start in this industry today than it was 25 years ago. Much harder. Really? Because most people would say, oh, the barriers are a little bit easier, but your experience is not that. No, I think especially for young engineers. Um, I, I, no, I need to start backwards, right? So when I started being a software developer, basically all that you needed like was a a code editor, which was very often a simple notepad, right? You needed a compiler and you needed a book. And, and that kind of got you through your first <laughs> years of your career, right? Uh, a young engineer that joins here on the first day, like from day one, he's exposed to dozens of frameworks. He needs to know dozens of technologies. Um, he needs to know things about machine learning. He needs to know things about data science in a little bit. He needs to be a, a, a very well-rounded engineer on, on a lot of topics. And all of these topics are hard. They're really fundamentally very hard to understand. And I, I, I talk a lot to, to young engineers and many of them are very overwhelmed with this, right? So if you uh, try to, to build a mobile app today um, that works at some kind of scale, you're dealing with... Uh, a dozen or two dozen frameworks and SDKs that you need to know. Simply, they are becoming part of your work, right? And that's that's very hard. So we invest a lot in going to universities, um, running our own internship programs where we design programs where young engineers or future engineers they get paired with very veteran, in very strong industry veterans that take them really through their through a month long journey to teach them as they come along, right? Um, and it's super important. It's a, it's a fascinating insight. And I think that when, you've, when you've framed it in that context, you're absolutely right in that, you know, they're coming in. One has also got the resource element as well. So that, you know, they're probably coming in and so many projects are on the go. Anyway, every CTO, CIO I speak to, there's hundreds of projects in the air at any one point. So they've probably got to inherit that and then also learn all of the framework. So yeah. I think that is actually a, a very good way of looking at it. And obviously as you, you said you've got the benefit of looking back on your own career and seeing the difference. Now, you, you mentioned been around uh, digital inclusion, and obviously you're mindful you're in across multiple markets around Asia. How are you preserving that, you know, that balance of the legacies and empowering the merchants to be part of the digital economy, but also expanding your revenue streams? I mean, the, as you mentioned there, a lot of them are potentially venturing into the digital world for the first time or have been through necessity. So I'm guessing there's a journey there, but how are you trying to strike a balance to help the merchants? So one thing that we're really, really keen on, and we're doing a lot of this, and it's it's, it's part of the this business that is completely invisible on, on the customer side of things, is we're working very closely with our merchants in really educating them not only how to get on the platform, that's, that's one thing, and that's clearly critical, but also how our consumers and how our users and how uh, the people that order food from them, how they perceive technology, right? What works in a menu and why does it work? So we're, we're spending a lot of time with our teams 
educating our partners around this so that they can make better decisions for their business, which is, which is very, very critical. Right? That starts from helping them to get better dish images because we no, just know that dishes that have really appetizing images will be much more, are much more likely to be ordered than dishes without these descriptions. Um, we work with them to explain them how user behavior is in an app like ours and where users focus and how long they stay on certain parts of the app that they optimize their product offering also for this, right? Um, and that's that's on the on the consumer facing, menu facing side. And then of course there's the entire backend, as we like to call it. How do we build tools that enable these partners to do these things for themselves at their convenience, from their own mobile phone, from their own environment, <clears throat> excuse me, from their own environment without having the need to be guided through that, right? And that's a fascinating journey in itself because it also teaches us a lot about our partners, right? How do they see the product? What are they struggling with and so on and so on. It's, uh, I mean, apart from a lot of key takeaways here, apart from making me very hungry as well, uh, <laughs> and, you know, start me through the, the Food Panda menu. <laughs> now, final one, you, you, you spoke a bit, obviously, of the technology elements, which is key, user experience, the, the community work that you're doing and how you're helping your, your merchants and your customers. Talk to me a little bit to, to finish around the, the tech hubs that you've launched, obviously in, in Asia, in, in Taiwan, in, in Singapore, maybe a little bit around what they are, but also the thought process behind the launches. So the, the key thought process, <clears throat> I'm a strong believer, and I do this a lot when I'm interviewing engineers. I'm, I'm very lucky to be in a position where I'm still interviewing engineers, um, from fresh grads to principal engineers. Um, one of the key thought process for me is I want to have engineers that are fans of the product. I want to have engineers sitting in markets where their friends and their families use the product that they build, right? Because that immediate feedback cycle is was for me always was the, the best part of the job when I could go out and show my friends, like, listen, I built this, right? And they come back with feedback and sometimes that feedback. And I suppose the company you're in now, you, you're afforded that because it's such a, a consumer-facing brand, whereas I suppose for not every company you're in, you would have that such close relationship. Yeah, no, we're very lucky to be able to be in, in an industry where we have this growth relationship. That was a key thinking on our hubs, right? So our Singapore regional tech hub is, will be, is home to around 300 engineers. Um, and we've recently launched a second hub in Taiwan that is ramping up very nicely. Um, and both of these markets are obviously key markets for Food Panda as a business. Both of these markets also have a very vibrant, very strong tech scene, um, which is great for us. Um, and both of these markets also enable us to give back into the tech community, whether we're working with universities or launching internship programs or doing mentorships. Um, so that was, was the core thinking. Um, Closeness to the market, um, strong engineering talent available, um, and we have an attractive brand, right? Uh, so that was the thing, and it's progressing really nicely. I'm super proud where we are with this hub today, and that allows us now in these hubs also to innovate very fast, that we use them as a test bed to build something, get a group of people together, ship a new product idea, put it out in the market and see if it works or not. And if it doesn't work, what we learn from that and then iterate fast. And, and final one, uh, Ben, what, what's top of your to-do list in the next six to 12 months? What's some of your key priorities? I mean, you're probably looking at, you've probably got a board behind you with a lot more on there than one item, I'm sure. But what, what's important for you to, to for 2022 and beyond? So clearly there is still a lot of more things where we want to drive where we really want to push the limit of what we can do for our partners. Um, there's always room for improvement there. That's one key pillar. The second key pillar is how do we get even better in turning insights that we get from our data into delivery of better features for our customers. I'm very happy where we are there today. Um, but now the question is like, how do we take it from the next level? How do we take it from great to really excellent? Right. Um, and then the third key thing on my priority list is how do we get even more involved in Food Panda in bringing mentorship and bringing 
education to people that are at the start of their career? How do we grow local tech communities in a healthy and sustainable way? Right? So this, uh, I think these three will keep me busy for the next 18 months or so. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll make a note there. I'll check back in in 18 months, see how you're getting on. For sure. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, Ben, really appreciate you taking the time with us to take us through your tech strategy, obviously the purpose and how you're giving back, and crucially those tech hubs and the people element as well. So thank you very much. Best of luck with the rest of the year and really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.